Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the World's Most Dangerous Morning Show, The Breakfast Club. Charlamagne the God, Angela Yee. You know Envy's running around on his book tour, but you know it is Mental Health Awareness Month, so you know who had to be here. Miss Shanti Dawes from Silence to Shame. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing? Hey, Shanti. We were talking about this being your fifth year anniversary yes. here on The yep. Breakfast Club. Yep. I mean, where's the champagne? Like... We, got we can make that happen. We, we got pop some bottles. We need to pop, pop something. Pop it. We really do need to get more I mean, celebratory. I know. Yeah. Talk about middle health. Around, like, what we, got? we got club? some wine. Hey. <laughs> we do have some wine. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, but I do no. want to say that I've seen a huge difference since you started coming up here up until now in the past five years even with people not being ashamed and wanting to talk more about mental health. Oh, I hope that our organization and oh, some of the stuff I've been saying have been able to help normalize that conversation. Well, how, how are you, first of all? You know, I'm okay. I don't know if y'all know, but I lost my mother yeah. um, late January. I feel like it's always a reoccurring theme with me healing. Um, I'm, I'm good this morning. Mm-hmm. Let me just say that. And I take that one day at a time. I no longer try to just sugarcoat how I'm feeling. And if I'm having a tough day, I'll say that. I was just on a panel on Friday, shout out to Dr. Chelsea Clinton Mm -hmm. at the Clinton Foundation, and I wasn't having a good day that morning. Mm -hmm. And I felt stressed and anxious, but I prayed about it, and I just tried to recenter myself. And, you know, I just, you know, have to figure out ways now to keep myself moving forward. That's why healthy coping mechanisms are important, because we all struggle every day in some form or fashion. But the key is to have ways to cope through it in a healthy way. I want to talk about some. Yeah, what are some of your coping mechanisms? So, like, for me, as I mentioned, like, you know, I just got up and I prayed that morning. And not to impose my faith. So if you believe in the universe or you just want to get outside and get immerse yourself in nature, I think nature is a great way to center yourself. Even this morning, like, you always get a little bit anxious because I love y'all showing what y'all represent. Mm -hmm. And, again, I'm not in the music industry like I used to be. Mm -hmm. So it's always an honor to do it. But I was a little anxious this morning. But... And the room was dark. And it's a small hotel room. Y'all know how New York hotel rooms mm-hmm. are. I know. But I got up and I let the blinds up and let the sun in. Mm. And it just ma- it just filled my heart with a certain level of peace that I can't explain. So I try to, like, let nature in. I go outside. I take walks. Um, I drink tea, really, because tea is really um, soothing. I'll exercise. I have a stationary bike. Um, and also I might call a girlfriend mm-hmm. and just, like, reminisce and laugh. Because one of the things, too, I think... When you think about wellness, it's like finding that inner child in mm-hmm. you and bringing <clears throat> bringing yourself back to a place of calm and something that's enjoyable. Or even listening to music, you know, what y'all might be playing, you know, on iHeartMedia on the show. Can we, can we talk about grief a little bit more? Please, because, yes. Because, you know, people, I think one of the biggest lies we ever told ourselves was time heals all wounds in regards to grief. I don't believe that anymore. Can I just speak candidly? Like, Please. Grief is a fucked up journey sometimes mm-hmm. for some. It's really tough. I'm still getting over the loss of Your my sister. sister, you know, which last week made three years for her. Um, and I think we all feel like, OK, we grieve. You know, you got all this influx of calls and messages and posts. Peace be with you. Prayers to your family that first week. Right. And then you're trying to get everything planned and the services and it's hectic. And then that next week when all the phone calls stop and people aren't calling and you got to sit in that grief. It's a lot. And some people internalize it and bury it and act like, okay, funeral's over, I'm done. Society tells me I got to snap back out of it and get back to work. That's some bullshit. We have to process through our grief and we have to allow ourselves to go through it. That's why you might see an ugly cry on my IG, you Mm -hmm. know, every now and then. Because I feel like being transparent and the thing about grief, it's okay to sit in it. You just can't stay in it. But you got to be able to sit in the valley and go through it. It's no way around it. And no two people grieve the same. Mm -hmm. Like for me, you know, I had lost weight because I had got my gallbladder removed last year. I went through some physical health issues and I gained all my weight back just recently um, because my mom passed. And I felt Mm -hmm. like I was eating my feelings and I'm still in therapy, which is I'm so proud of myself. I've been in therapy, you know, nonstop for six months, and that's new for me, Mm because sometimes I'll start and stop, and I think, okay, I'm doing this work, I know how to cope, but that's a lie, too. Mm -hmm. And um, I have this great uh, book that I read called um, The Gift of Grief, I think that's the name of it, and uh, it's by Dr. Ajeta Robinson. And it just talks about allowing yourself the grace and space that you need. Um, I just feel like we have to create safe spaces, and we have to give more grace 
to people right. when they're grieving. We do. You never know what somebody's you going through. Don't. Too. You don't. And it someone. could be 10 years mm-hmm. later. And I talk to people when I share stuff about my mom. And I got so many people posting or leaving comments saying, yo, my mom's been dead 10 years and my pop's been dead 15 years. And I still find myself, I could be at a red light or I hear a song and I just want to cry. And what I'll say to you is cry. Let it out. That's right. Like tears are therapeutic. You know, it's like water to your soul. That's the biggest thing, right? Because every, every therapist will tell you, feel your feel. So it's like 100%. we get overwhelmed with these emotions and we act like that's wrong. Like, no. Right. Like you're grieving. For like, sure. Let it out. You got to let it out. And not a lot of people understand the grief journey and how it equates to our overall mental health and wellness. And so that's why you got to be able to like go through it and not act like it didn't happen. And I know like some of my homeboys, I'll see when, you know, loved ones pass and they're like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. And I'm like, really, though? You you good for real? Because if you good, that's great. Mm-hmm. But if you're not, let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. Like, don't say that just because you think that's what we're supposed to hear. That's why when I ask people if they're OK, especially after COVID, I need an honest answer. For sure. And if they're like, oh, I'm good. Well, what, what's your energy like? Because then they can't just say I'm good with that one. <laughs> like, and when people, when I say pe- to people like, how you doing? And they say I'm good. I'm like, nah, how you feeling though? Because mm-hmm. you might be good. Your bills might be paid. You know what I'm saying? You got your job. You got a place to live. But how you really feeling? All right. Absolutely. It's a big difference. Absolutely. Big difference. Well, I, and I do want to say, as you were talking about, um, you know, the journey and feeling your feels and all of that, I find, like, for myself, I'm not a big crier, so... Mm-hmm. And I and, am. Oh, right. God. And I'm really not. Like, I could be <laughs> I at a funeral, like and I just, for some reason, it's not really how I express myself. And that's okay. Right. And that's okay. But I find that, like, when something happens, it hits me the hardest right away, but I allow that to happen. Mm-hmm. And then as time does pass, it does get better and every now and then you know you think about things it might not be you know all day like it was at first and yeah. it might not be you know once a day then it, it you know it gets less and less and then sometimes you want to feel you feel guilty too 100 percent about not like basking in that and moving on and having a you know having things go well and then you're like man should i be you know happy right now or having a good time The one thing I'll say to you is, again, I said everybody grieves differently and we all process our emotions differently. Right. So it's nothing wrong that you will grieve hard or cry about it and then kind of move back into it. Maybe that's just how you process things. But if you do have that one kind of fleeting moment or something comes on that reminds you of something, just allow yourself to go through it. Like I'll find myself at a red light and I just might just let out an ugly cry. Right. Or like my organization, I'm so excited. I know we'll talk about this. Um, we did a, we, we're doing these things called Silence to Shame Sunday dinners. And we had two black families come with their kids and we had a therapist and my um, good friend, Dr. Cherry Collier, moderate the conversation. And we were talking about kids opening up and wanting to talk to parents and how parents sometimes don't understand what they're going through and they don't allow them to be themselves. And it just got into this whole thing. And I was having like a great time participating in the conversation. And then it struck a nerve with me and I had, I imploded. Mm. And it was about things that didn't happen to me, did or didn't happen in my childhood and how I always wanted like a nuclear family and wanted my family to sit down and have dinner together. But we didn't just, we didn't grow up sitting down eating dinner at the Mm -hmm. table on Sundays but it just took me back to such a a painful place in my life and then my dad's suicide and I just had a meltdown on camera because we were filming this and I was like you know what I'm not embarrassed though right it's okay Mm because that was what I had to do in that moment so to you again give yourself that grace when you need to Mm -hmm. but don't feel a way about it and don't think like am I supposed to if there is no am I supposed to you gotta do what is Right, for Angela, right? Mm-hmm. How does Angela do things? I think one of the, uh, the, 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 the the toughest, you know, things to deal with, I don't say toughest, but mm-hmm. when you start doing that inner child work, oh yeah, <laughs> man, you start it's... realizing that most of the Ooh. things you do as an adult are directly because of something that happened to you in your childhood. That generational trauma is real. Man. And you peel back the layers of all of that. You know, your girl, Dr. Alfie, and their Coma right. Project, they do so much great work. You know, around trauma and and how that affects the body, but you you got to unpack it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why a lot of people are afraid of therapy too, because they don't want to go there mm-hmm. and they don't want to keep digging and digging. And I'm not saying you got to just unpack everything so that it like throws you off your game, but you got to know what happened in your life and in your family and your history to be able to have healthy ways to cope and moving forward, so that when you get older and get married and have your families, that you're not 
continuing that cycle. Mm -hmm. We got to break the cycles and got to break the curses. I want to add, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say it is Mental Health Awareness Month. And I want to talk about what Silence the Shame is doing because we want to make sure, of course, that we're letting people know how they can participate and support. And Silence the Shame Day is Is, May uh, 5th today. May 5th, yes, yes, yes. yes. Today. Yes. yes, Silence the Shame Day is today. We're so excited. So um, we have this wonderful national campaign going on. You can um, go to our site or go to our um, Instagram page, and we have um, a link to an actual virtual frame so you can upload your own photo, and there's ways to give. You can text the word SILENCE to 707070, or you can go to our website and donate. And we're just celebrating all of this great stuff that we've done. Um, shout out to Senator Anderson and Deanna Hamilton in Atlanta. Um Governor Kemp signed a resolution for us designating May 1st, which was just this past Sunday, as Black Children's Mental Health Day in the state of Georgia. And we're trying to take that to other states. Mm -hmm. Shout out New York. We want to be able to do that and recognize that. And we want to take it federal. So maybe our organizations can partner on that. And then, um, you know, we just had a big uh, text-a-thon and tweet-a-thon. Also, we're doing wellness seminars. You know, we've partnered with Sony Music Publishing and John Platt, and so we've created these workplace wellness trainings. For anybody that works in radio or the community at large and music industry, you can get those for free. Um, I also um, partnered with Atlanta Influences Everything um, to create some special shirts for the month of May. And, you know, that's a big cultural brand in Atlanta. So it says Atlanta Influences Mental Health. And then our logo's on the side, and so a portion of those proceeds will go to us. And then I... Also, this week when I was in New York, I did a talk at the Pinterest um, office with um, Kenneth Cole, and he has the Mental Health Coalition mm-hmm. that we're mm-hmm. all a part of, and they're doing great work. We just have so much stuff going Shanti, on. you are no joke. I just want to say, plan. like, <laughs> all the work that you've been doing for all these years. Thank and you. And based off of your own experiences, it's so important being able to help others and to see through, you know, everything that you've been through and are still going through daily and just using those experiences, and people can relate to you so much. Thank you. That means a lot Um, because I often I was telling the young lady, Katie, that's with me that works for us and shout out to the STS team that, you know, sometimes when I see my friends and colleagues from music, I'll be lying if I said, what would life have been like had I stayed, you know, at the labels and, you know, all of my friends are like presidents of labels and running their own companies. But I am like so proud of where I am right now and the fact that I can accept, you know, God's will over my life. Like I had to take this charge. It was like an assignment for my life. So like I feel like he put you in rooms where you need to be. And I was somebody that could come, I think, into this space, into, you know, dealing with athletes and dealing with entertainers and that sort of thing. And they'll be okay with talking about it. Right. right? So, and you know, I'm just a country girl from the A, so I keep it real with you. You know, Mm -hmm. like I said, if I'm having a bad day, I'm going to tell you. So if people see Shanti Das, and I say that in the most humble way, but if they see Shanti Das going through it, then it's Mm -hmm. okay if I go through it and I can get help too. Yeah, that's not an easy thing. That's a scary thing to turn away from. 100%. Something that you've been so successful at and what people know you for and an industry that a lot of people would love to be in. And to just say, okay, this is the work that God has put me on this path 100%. Today. And I got to tell you, I follow you. I see all the amazing stuff you do. And shout out to whoever does your hair because your hair is always bomb. <laughs> and I'm like, I wish sometimes I could get all dolled up and pretty. You but, you know, <laughs> money is funny and nonprofit. Like, we mm-hmm. still, like, you know, I live a humble life in terms of the salary. I, I make a nonprofit salary. Mm-hmm. Um, I speak on the side, so I'm grateful for those opportunities when I can. But it's different. Like, I don't get to you know, go and buy all the cute stuff and be able to get my hair done every single week. It's just different. I had to choose a different life. But what I'll say is we people are hurting. They are dying. Mm-hmm. You know, shout out to the family of Naomi Judd. You know, there was a, a young girl that took her own life who was a track star at a college and another girl who played soccer. I mean, we're hearing so many suicides of high profile people and, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. I, I just did a panel two weeks ago in D.C., with the National Council. They're the organization that does mental health first aid. And I was on a panel with a former NFL player, um, Marcus Smith and Solomon Thomas, who now plays for the Jets. Shout out to the Jets and Solomon. And hearing what these athletes go through, it's just like we are in a critical moment in our time and we don't know what the ramifications are going to be from this pandemic. New variants are still coming up. You know, people are still getting sick. It, we're at war, you know, we're almost at war in certain places. And it's just a lot. To process so when you wake up every morning you got to be grateful for that day that's right you got to have the tools to get you through that day you know even when you talk about not being in the music industry no more like just think about how god works like the music industry needs people like you more than ever right thank now. you so, so much. so who was who, who would reach back 
who would reach back to these rappers? Who would reach back to these artists if they weren't somebody who was already in that mm. to know what they're going through? Yeah, like, thank you for saying that, too. We did a talk at uh, TSU in Houston, um, my girl Shannon set up, and I spoke to the artist Mona Leo. I think she's been on the show before. Has Mona Leo been on the show? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, um, but she's a dope rapper from Houston, and she really opened up and was very transparent. And on a Friday afternoon on a college campus, we had 60 students talking about mental health right. and opening up in ways that I can't even explain to you. And But Mooski has been on the show. Yeah. Absolutely. Mooski actually is doing um, something with us on Saturday. We're doing a teen wellness clinic. We're getting 100 teens in Atlanta together. We're going to do wellness and yoga and fireside chats. We're going to be talking to him. And so, yeah, I think I am that person to bridge the gap between culture and mental health and wellness. And, you know, I, I just love what I do. And, you know, we honored you last year at our gala. We have our gala coming up on May 14th, a brilliant Thank Mike gala. Uh, Dallas Austin, the music producer, is our co-chair. It's hosted by Q Parker from 112. And we're honoring um, NFL player Chris Hubbard from the Cleveland Browns, who has his own mental, mental health foundation, and also Marcus Smith, who's a former player. So I, I love music and sports, so I think it's so dope for me to be able to go back into these spaces um, and really open up these conversations in an authentic way so people don't feel embarrassed or ashamed. Because like I said, I'm still healing. Right. And and one of the things I just want to say, and I hope you can support us on this too, Silence of Shame just launched an initiative called Healing in Public. And that's really how we should look at it, because we all got to get up and go to work. That's right. We got jobs. You got to show up. But you show up as you're healing in public, and that's okay. So you allow yourself to be unapologetic. You give yourself the grace that you need. And so if I do tell someone I'm not having a bad day, that no one will put shame on me mm -hmm. because I am, quote, unquote, healing in public. And, mm. you know, just like labels and um, professional sports teams have financial advisors and make sure you have your health insurance and make sure you're set for the future. I see people are, are now incorporating mental health and professionals into those fields as well. So many companies and organizations are doing it. You know, I talk to a lot of labels now, even when I was on the panel with the athletes, I said, to your point, Angela, you know, you got to get your agent, you got to get your manager, you got to get the, your publicist. Where is your wellness team? Where's your life coach? Where's your right. therapist? Shout out to my life coach, Dr. Um, Sherry Riley. Um, you need all of these people as a part of your team. When you get signed, when you sign that record deal or when you sign that football contract or for anybody else, when you're just starting out, you're graduating from college, you know, you need the right people around you. I talk about having your start in five, right? We, it's the playoffs. We're in basketball season. Mm -hmm. You can't get on the court unless you got five players. So you really shouldn't start your day and your life or your new career unless you got five people that you feel like you can trust, a therapist, a doctor, a best friend, somebody that you can be your authentic self with That's right. and open up whenever you need to. So I want to be able to do more stuff like that and bring it to other companies and organizations. And, and I want to just take this thing around the world. I love what you're doing with the, the, the black children's mental health. Yes. That's, that's, is that COPE? So no. COPE, that's the COPE clinic. That's what we're okay. doing with the teens. But for black children, and that is a part of that, right? Okay. So the, the resolution that we had written about black children's mental health um, was something, again, because there's so many barriers to treatment and access to care in our communities, for communities of kids of color in general, right? Whether we don't have insurance or we can't find a good psychiatrist or therapist that look like us. I mean, how many times have I recommended somebody, but they're all booked up? So we also need to encourage our young kids, especially kids of color and black kids, to go to college and think about psychiatry, right, and psychology as a career path. That's right. Because sometimes we need somebody who understands our culture. Cultural competency. Yeah, you know, I'm wearing, again, my, my culture jacket from that I got from Milan Influences Everything. Like, our kids, they clam up if we don't understand one another. So if we're going to be talking to somebody and open up about you know, these deep, dark secrets and problems, we at least want you to understand why I wear my hair in braids mm -hmm. and not question that or why I do what I do, right, from a community perspective. And also, just when it comes to kids, I don't know if it's because there's so many conversations going on about mental health. Mm -hmm. These kids have the language, and they're oh, using it. yeah. These kids are talking about how depressed they are, their anxiety, their low self-esteem, yes. everything, and that... Is terrifying. And that's something that we didn't do. Exactly. And I'm scared that just now they are opening up that the resources don't meet the needs. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we don't have enough resources. That is why policy is so important. That's why we want to get more states to recognize this. And then also we, you know, create some bills and get them written into law. 
because nothing's going to change. And in a lot of these larger states, they just don't have the capacity. And also we're seeing the uptick of violence, you know, in a lot of our cities. And when you think about the violence, you know, yeah, you know, you got good and bad in every society, you know, every race and ethnicity. But some of our kids in the black community get labeled as, quote unquote, bad or having bad behavior. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the whole child, something they talk about is a notion in education. You can't, you know, deal with certain things without dealing with the whole child because that child might be coming home and they got three and four brothers, a single parent, their mom, the violence is in the house that they're wit- witnessing and all this other stuff that's adding to the anxiety and pressure, you know, and it's just too much for them that's going on. So, yeah, mm-hmm. they might go to school the next day and exhibit bad behavior, but it doesn't mean they're a bad child. Right. It means they have a lot going on at home. So that's what. So to your point, they're opening up, they're talking about it. But what are we really going to do collectively and how are we going to change the school system so that, you know, I think they say it should be uh, one psychologist per 500 students. But there's a map. If you Google it, it's more like one school psychologist for like every four or five thousand kids or every 10,000 kids when you get into rural communities and and communities of color. That's terrible. And that's why we're seeing an uptick, uptick and increase in suicidal ideation amongst kids as young as six years old. That's right. That's crazy. So with that said, once the kids start in therapy, how, 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 how young you think is too young? So I don't know the statistics around that, but I will share, even when I was on the panel um, at the Clinton Center, and we were talking a lot about education to social justice and mental health, I do think that you should at least start having conversations with kids when they're like three years old and five years old, just about their feelings, mm-hmm. right. because they got to understand happy thoughts, sad thoughts and how to be able to reprocess or, or, or retrace that anger or, or happiness and joy, you know, around. And so start talking to them at a young age, excuse me, so they know it's OK to open up and share. Because even like me, you know, I was saying when I imploded the other day at the STS Sunday dinner, my mom, I loved her to death. She instilled good morals and values, but we didn't have open conversations a lot. So I buried a lot of my feelings. So if I was having a bad day or if I was sad about my daddy, you know, at five years old, learning that your daddy's really not coming back and he actually took his own life. That yeah. was a lot for me as a kid to process. But we didn't have open forums or open dialogue. And so we got to allow our kids to be more open younger and be more transparent. And you got to be able to talk to them about it. You know what I wanted to ask you in Florida, right? The don't say gay bill and the disproportionate amount of LGBTQ children who uh, actually attempt Mm. and sometimes do take their own lives. How do you think that will affect them? Because you're talking about having these conversations and you can't have them in the home, right? But just not at school. How do you think that's going to affect kids? I think it's going to affect them tremendously. Um, You know, shout out to the Trevor Project that does a lot in the uh, youth LGBTQ plus IA community. So if you're talking about it at home, but then you go to school and nobody can talk about it, you don't feel like you can express yourselves, you know, I think you'll start seeing bullying happen, right? Because we're even seeing it from a racism perspective, like voting rights and certain things and and certain people feel like they can be bullies. You're going to have that in the school systems and you're going to see, I think, higher cases of anxiety, right? Higher cases of suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. We got to let people be themselves. And I think we're taking a step back in our nation. That's why our local elections are so important. I don't tell people who to vote for, but I tell them to do the research and understand what's going on because we're reshaping history in a bad direction in some form or fashion in some of these states. And it's going to really, I think, lead to the detriment of a lot of our kids. And I could see a lot of kids in that community taking issue with it and having to go to school and feel like they have to put on a mask That's right. and be somebody that they're not. You and know, social if you're media opening, makes it easier. If you're open about it and your parents accept you for who you are, right? If you, you know, even the use of pronouns and, and, and not being able to have to put labels so much on what they are from a sexual um, orientation perspective, if you get to school and you can't be yourself, like, that's a lot. And I don't, I, I could see it being really difficult for our kids. And I don't know that they'll even, if you can't talk about it in the classroom, that probably that school counselor is not really going to be able to be of service and help to you either if they're getting a mandate from up top that right. we don't talk about this. Yeah, these kids are even asking what do counselors do? But, you know, when, when, even in regards to, like, social media, right? Like, I, I was talking to yeah. a young kid, and um, 
they were like, I don't want to talk to a therapist. That's like telling a stranger your problems. I said, yeah, but you're venting on social media. Mm. Same so you're thing, you're telling, you're a, telling whole, a million, a million strangers <laughs> that, that don't care about you, that aren't trying to help 100%. you your problems. Yeah, because we look at social media as, you know, and it's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm on IG and other platforms because I know we have to do it, and, and it's a way to promote yourself. But I see just this terrible trend in social media where – you know, it's like this perfectionism wheel or real. And you're looking at people's lives and some of it might be real and some of it might be fake. You know, how many times have we seen, you know, girls and guys put filters over their photos? That really ain't what you look like, right? And, and it's nothing wrong that you want to enhance your beauty, but also you're not giving that person a realistic look of yourself. So they're putting all these, you know, unexpected uh, pressures and expectations on themselves. And it's really difficult for our kids. Right. And if if you don't feel like you can open up, and that's why I'm saying it's so important to have five people that you can talk to and open up with. But I will say for me, I see the flip side of that too. Like when I first started telling people that I was contemplating taking my own life in 2015, I started sharing on social media and my family couldn't understand it. Mm. And they were like, why are you telling all these strangers your business? Mm. You know, why are you opening up like that? And it was something that was, it was a release for me. And it was just something peaceful about putting it on there, but actually not caring. Right. So, see, I did it for different. I put it on there and I share it with strangers. But I didn't care what they thought. And that's the difference. I don't think our kids are at that point where they don't care what their peers think. So I do think, you know, I like the fact that Instagram and, and, and Meta and, you know, Facebook are now doing certain features where it, sh- it doesn't show the number of likes. So I hope, you know, that they continue to do more. I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. And TikTok and all these other companies, you know, making sure our kids are on it for the right reasons. But the one thing I have problems with is I feel like they pull an okie doke on all of us because these algorithms, Mm -hmm. it's like your feed and your page now, it's not what it used to be. The user experience is so different. Yeah. And then the thing about it is if if these kids are looking at images that might not be so good for them, they're re-traumatizing themselves and they don't even understand it every time they see it even when you think about what happened with George Floyd and all these you know acts of violence that we've seen on people in our community I can't watch those images and I don't want our kids watching it and regurgitating that over and over and over again because it is going to traumatize them but these mm-hmm. kids that's why we do things like the Coke clinic so that kids understand mental health from a way like we feel like we got to meet you where you're at right so the clinic that we're doing with the Hawks we're going to have you know, some one-on-one, hopefully, uh, three-point shooting going on. We're going to have young people talking to them about their mental health, but really getting them to open up and understand, like, talking to a therapist is actually okay, you know? Right. Sometimes you need someone from an objective perspective and not your friends who are going to be subjective. Right, and it's hard And social media, they're going to be subjective. Your parents, some people, and culturally, your parents will tell you in certain places, you know, not to open up to strangers and not to tell the family business. And that's true. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, um, you know, you don't have to tell everybody, but they need to know that. It's okay. I think the important yeah. thing is it's a safe space. So you need to teach your kids that therapy and especially, and, and you know, sometimes you might get a therapy that's not that great. That's like any other doctor or anything. Mm-hmm. You might have to keep searching till you find the right one for yourself or for your child, but let them know that those are safe spaces for them to talk about. That's the difference, Angela. Is, yeah, you don't want to tell, you don't have to tell, you know, any stranger or people your business, but know the ones that you can share with and know that those are safe spaces that they can open up and share. How do we how do we acknowledge Mental Health Awareness Month? That's what May is. May is Mental Health Awareness it Month. Is. How do we acknowledge it? I think the best way is, is just showing up and starting those conversations in your households, you know, being open and, you know, reposting positive, you know, affirmations giving resources within your own families and your communities. I see a lot of, you know, churches and people in the faith community that are now holding mental health awareness events. So that's great. Um, so you just got to be a part of the solution and not the problem. Again, sharing information, normalizing that conversation, you know, maybe taking a, a you know, a day at dinner and say, OK, y'all, we hear we, we put our phones away. We're just going to talk about how we feel. Right. So you got to be able to incorporate that into your own household. It starts one household at a time. That's how you can honor and and acknowledge it. And again, making sure that you're passing out resources and information. Because I get a lot of calls from families when, because I tell people we all have mental health. We may not all have a mental illness. And I've said that over and over again, but it really is important. But when you have a family that might be going through a crisis, you need the tools and resources. So we've got to be able to share that information and, you know, put it up 
you know, share it in your workplace, right? You know, just really normalize the conversation. And, and, and yes, I know we have a month for everything, but mental health awareness should be 12 months, you know, Absolutely. a year. It's got to be something that we deal with because, again, we're seeing mental health, we're seeing self-care, and I feel like a little bit, you know, sometimes like some of these companies are using it, right, mm-hmm. as a, a way to brand and, and market and sell stuff. But it's serious business. Mm-hmm. It's just like physical health. Um, I'm excited. I'm actually starting um, my own personal podcast. Um, I've rebranded my personal company um, called Mibo, M-I-B-O, and it's for mind and body. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to be talking to people like yourselves about mental and physical health and how that really goes hand in hand. Because when I first um, left New York City in 2010, I was diagnosed, diagnosed with cervical spinal stenosis, and it was a direct result of stress. And I didn't realize I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, I was stressed out at work, and how that really took a toll on my mental health. So it really goes hand in hand. So Mebo is going to be like a lifestyle brand. Uh, I got my first T-shirt I'm selling, mm-hmm. and the name of it is I Got 99 Problems, but Therapy Ain't One. <laughs> so I'm taking like a spin on hip-hop and, and doing merchandise and really just trying to make wellness a lifestyle um, and not just a fad. Right. right? Absolutely. Because after, you know, when the curtains close and people move on to the next thing that's important for our nation. I'm going to still be out here on the front lines fighting for the mental health I don't and think wellness th- of everybody. I don't think this is going anywhere. I think it's one of those things where it's like we, we, we've hit it for so long and yeah. haven't discussed it for so long, but it's been impacting us, yes. impacting our parents and our grandparents. Yeah. I don't think that conversation is ever going anywhere. When I see these kids having the language and talking yeah. to me about the depression and anxiety they're dealing with and wanting to sit down and talk to somebody, that's not going they're nowhere. They're all talking about it now, hey, to yep. your point. And, I, you know, a little shameless plea, like, we are still a grassroots organization. You know, we've been we've had our 501c3 for five years, as you know. I've been doing this work for seven years. And we still, our annual budget, budget is under a million dollars. And mm-hmm. we see the same organizations getting all the big donors. So, you know, I'm just, my prayer, I ain't begging, but my prayer is that somebody continues to see the work that we do and want to pour into us. Because anyway, you can't scale an organization. Nonprofit is still a business. We need staff. Yeah. We need more team members. That's right. And so I pray that we can have 20 staff members and we can open Sound Sustain Wellness Centers in our communities and provide free therapy. But you know, we, website, need those, Shanti. we need those 10, 20 million dollar donations. So the Jay-Z's and Rock Nations of the world and the Bezos and all those folks like we really do need. And it's y'all. interesting that, you know, so many people in the business. Do you feel I know, like. But you know what? Mental health is still, a, you right. know, it ain't the easiest conversation. And it's got to, you know, be able, like I, I can't, you know, tell people how to spend their money. But hopefully, that's why I go so hard, Angela. Mm-hmm. And you see me, I'm on and off of planes. I'm doing some smallest event with 10 people to something that might have a 1,000 people like your wonderful conference that you mm-hmm. do. But I just got to keep fighting the fight. And I just know it's going to happen. Somehow the funds are going to come. And, you know, again, shout out to Jack and Jill who supports us. NFL Players Association, we do a lot with them. It's some wonderful organizations, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. We're getting ready to do some stuff with Microsoft. I'm excited about that. But I think, you know, Eventually, it'll happen. I just, I'm keeping, you Give know, them the, the website, because that, that's another way to www. honor and acknowledge yes. Mental Health Awareness Month. you can donate to other great organizations, and one of those, hopefully, will be our organization, www.silencetoshame.com, or you can text the word SILENCE, S-I-L-E-N-C-E, to 707070. Absolutely. Well, I'm Shanti, a, always a, amazing to have you. I know we do this to honor you and to make sure we bring light to silence to shame every single year. Thank but you. But you do that work 365 days. Yes, so she we does. we appreciate you for that. And I need you for the Mental Wealth Expo again this year. Let's do it. Yep. Let's do it bigger. And we, we, we want to do something in Atlanta with you, too. So. Right, let's do it. Let's Especially do it. around them kids, man. Like oh I, my I, that's, gosh. That's, that's That initiative, we have to get so the take Cope, nationwide. So the Cope Clinic, we're trying to take and do in other states and as well as honoring Black Children's Mental Health Day. So we already talking to an organization about California. So, brother, let's join forces and let's get all these states to do it. Absolutely. Let's do it. It's Shanti Dawes, Silence to Shame. National Silence to Shame Day is Post, the day. Te- text, tweet, donate. All donate. Right today. Mo- very important to donate. <laughs> 70, 70, 70? <laughs> yes. <laughs> text silence to 70, 70, 70. All right. Thank you. Shout out to Envy. We miss you, brother, but good luck on the book tour. It's Shanti Dodd. It's The Breakfast Club. 